Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Shah, and on behalf of Calvas, I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Today we have another very interesting topic, and I'm really honored to welcome and introduce our distinguished guest speaker, who is going to talk about the neuroeducation, exploring the potential of brain-based learning principles. As you know, that world perspective is being changed with the advancement in science and technology. So how can we move, uh, more, uh, learn more uh, and use neuroscience to enhance our brain-based learning principle? So you will get the best insights, right information and knowledge about all these things because we have an expert with us in today, this session. So stay tuned because an amazing stuff are coming ahead in this session. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank all of us for arranging such enlightenment sessions for their support and providing uh, such a wonderful platform. The aim of the Calvas is to give you the opportunity to interact with the world-renowned speakers, teachers, authors, researchers, experts, professionals, and businessmen to share their views, experiences, and tips which will create impact and will enable you to learn new things and develop yourself in order to grow individually as well as to contribute to the world at large. As our slogan is come, learn and share knowledge. So today our guest is very special. She is internationally known and a dynamic personality. We always see her while contributing to the field and world in different ways. She is always ready to share her knowledge. So let me introduce her formally. She's a global educator, uh, STEM instructor, ICT teacher, trainer, neuroeducation researcher, international keynote speaker, author of scientific books for kids, and Global Peace Ambassador in Greece. She has a postgraduate degree in language teaching related to cognitive neurosciences. And she's also a passionate researcher on cognitive neurosciences and neuroeducation. Currently, she is a STEM in instructor at the Greek uh, Astronomy and Space Company. And she is also working at the Greek Ministry of Education at the Directorate of Educational Technology and Innovation, where she writes the uh, STEM uh, projects for Greek schools. She has been awarded many national and international prizes over 120 and she is a Global Teacher Award 2020 and 2021 uh, winner and a Global Teacher Prize finalist 2019. Recently she has been selected as a Global Icon 2020 featured in Passion Vista magazine among the top 10 women entrepreneurs featured in Fortune uh, and among the 100 most successful uh, women in business featured in Amazon book by the Global Trade uh, Chamber. She promotes STEM vision by introducing STEM as a, uh, astronomy and physics projects and combines STEM with the language teaching. She is a founder of international coordinator of many innovative international projects that focus on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals described in the uh, 2030 agenda. Furthermore, she is a social activist, a global peace ambassador, senior advisor of a United Nations Peacekeepers Federal Council. She has received many humanitarian and peace awards for her international humanitarian uh, organization. Uh, in addition to that, she is a global council member of Chartered Institute of uh, Leadership, Education and Development country chair of uh, G100 as advisory board member of the Asian African Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Africa, Asia, uh, Scholar Global Network, and many more. So in addition to that, uh, she is an executive director of education of a forum uh, uh, plus 36 peace and uh, unity and international ambassador of uh, volunteerism uh, and education of the Greek Academy of Volunteerism and Education Health Health. In addition to that, uh, she is an editorial board member of many journals. She has presented her research in numerous international conferences, e-conferences, and she has published work in a various journals. Uh, last but not the least, she is a wonderful speaker, author, teacher, and above everything, she's a great human being. So please help me in welcoming our guest, Prof. Rania Lampo. Uh, welcome to the Calvas platform, and thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Greetings from Greece. I'm very, very excited and very honored to be here today in this global platform. 
Thank I'm you, very Esther. grateful for uh, your kind invitation, and I want to thank back the university also for the organization thank of you. this uh, webinar. I hope it will be very interesting for our audience because you know we're going to explore today all this fascinating world of neuroeducation, yes. cognitive neuroscience, which is not well known. And uh, what we're going to see, all these brain-based strategies are not applied only to education, but in many other sectors. We're talking today about neuro business and neuro management and neuro strategic uh, plans. So um, what we're going to see have many, many applications. I'm going to focus as an educator, of course, uh, in education, but uh, there are all these principles have a universal um, value and application. And uh, of course, we're going to see how this uh, framework, uh, new education framework, can help uh, teachers to cope with uh, the challenges of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so, may I share my presentation now? Yeah, sure, please. Uh, as a reminder to the audience that uh, uh, Prof will be presenting and she will leave time for the question and answer at the end of the session. If you have any question, you can write in comment section or you can email us. Uh, we will ask the uh, speaker regarding that thing. So, uh, over to you, Prof. Uh, it's visible. Thank you. <laughs> Can you see also the change of slides? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Yes. Can you so, just hide the uh, message uh, because it is showing on the main screen, please? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So neuroscience is undoubtedly the most active. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Prof. You are okay, uh, okay. audible. Please get, carry on. Please. Neuroscience is undoubtedly the most active scientific field of the moment, and its specialists now have tools of incredible precision at their disposal, and they are more willing than ever to strive to uncover the most intimate mechanism of our consciousness. The field of neuroscience focuses on the scientific study of the nervous system, analyzing both its structure and its way of functioning. And it belongs to the big family of what we call uh, cognitive sciences, which were first introduced in the 1950s. This term was used in association with five other uh, bounding disciplines, computer science, neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, linguistics, anthropology, and sure, more other disciplines are, uh, were associated with it. So the cognitive uh, sciences have experienced a meteoric uh, uh, rise, which can also be described as a scientific revolution. And nowadays, that form a very broad interdisciplinary field where uh, many and diverse approaches coexist. From uh, uh, the 80s onwards, the constant rise in popularity and interest in the field of neuroscience made them the pivot of cognitive sciences. Uh, in uh, 1985, we now know the psychologue uh, uh, Harold Gardner, who published the first history of the cognitive revolution uh, with the title A New Science of the Mind. And we have also the decade of 90s, which were called the decade of the brain. And uh, then uh, a lot of new models were developed, such as embodied cognition, uh, symbolic model, connection in situated or distributed cognition, and evolutionary psychology. And in the early of uh, uh, 2000, a new configuration was put in place because there is no longer a dominant model. The development and rise of new brain imaging techniques advanced the study of brain actively, uh, activity considerably. So neuroscience today is uh, at the crossroads of uh, biological, chemical, medical, computer, mathematical, and uh, psychological sciences. Uh, we all know uh, the famous uh, neuroscientist, uh, uh, French neuroscientist Jean-Pierre Jean Sanger, uh, which he is considered as a representative of the cultivation of biology for 40 years. And uh, his uh, uh, very known books, The Neural Man and Man of Truth, have made history in the field of neuroscience. So according to Jean-Pierre Sanger, a neuroscience will bring us a new vision, a new conception of man and humanity, and neuroscience inaugurates actually the lights of the 21st century. Uh, so what is the goal of neuroscience? It's actually not just to map and spot the biological processes involved in cognition, the act of knowing, uh, it's much more than that. Uh, we all uh, now use the term of cognitive neuroscience to indicate the ultimate aim to understand mental operations by identifying links between structures and functions. And uh, of course, this is related to learning. We're going to see that. 
Human brain is a miracle because the cells of the human brain are organizing themselves into networks that communicate with each other, they store and process information and learn new things. And uh, uh, the role of emotions for a long time, we all know that cognitive science was centered on the study of cognitive phenomena, but uh, uh, hopefully for some time uh, more recently, it is the emotions which have been at the forefront of studies in this field. Uh, it's uh, worth to know, to mention that Antonio Damasio and Joseph Ledoux are the most important uh, scientists about this. They help popularize the idea that higher intellectual functions are closely connected with emotions something that we see now uh, in the field, especially in business, how uh, IQ will should be related in emotional intelligence, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, we have all this explosion, the, so, uh, uh, the science of emotion, because it's actually science of emotion. And after years of neglect uh, by MOF, uh, mainstream, biology, psychology, the study of emotions have emerged as a central topic now of scientific inquiry in the UDC of neuroscience, what is the function of emotion? What is the role of body in emotions? What are the feelings and how do they relate to emotions? And uh, is there an emotional brain? And uh, when it comes to emotion, uh, it turns out that there are some regions in the brain, specifically in the limbic uh, system. Uh, here we can see uh, the limbic system um, that are associated with each of uh, six main uh, emotions. Emotions are complex, you all know. Psychologists say that we only have uh, six basic emotions, which are happiness, anger, sadness, fear, surprise, and disgust. And all of other emotions are built from six basic emotions. For example, jealousy uh, stems from a control feeling of anger or sadness, while satisfaction can be a type of happiness. Um, so um, we can see here that uh, emotion has a uh, uh, a substantial influence on the cognitive processes, including perception, attention, learning, memory, reasoning, and problem solving. And it has a particularly strong influence, uh, especially uh, on attention, when we uh, try to modul uh, modulate the selectivity of attention and as well as motivating action behavior. And also, um, it is, has proven to that uh, emotion facilitates encoding and helps retrieval information physically. We're going to see all that. So, remember that the limbic system had some important regions. Hypo hypothalamus which controls emotional responses and is also involved in hormone release, regulating body temperature. Hippocampus, very, very important, is associated with memory, helps preserve and retrieve memories. And it also plays a role how we understand the special dimensions of our environment. Amygdala, um, during the COVID pandemic, it was the region which was very um, uh, well hit and by the COVID pandemic because it's the region of the fear and it uh, actually helps coordinate responses to stimuli in your environment and plays an important role in fear and anger. Thalamus is a sensory relay uh, station where all sensory information except from, uh, from smell goes before being sent to other areas of the brain for further processing and limbic cortex this part contains two structures the cingulate gyrus and the motion structures in the uh, brain. Uh, great. We all know that uh, the nervous system is actually uh, the main um, uh, learning tool. And uh, the most important, I think, discovered in the recent years, it's what we call um, brain plasticity. It uh, refers to the spectacular capacity of the brain to reconfigure itself from a functional point of view in response to stimuli from the environment. That means that even in uh, um, when we are adults, and we, uh, our brain uh, continues to create neural connections in our brain. That means that we never stop to create, to have in our brain uh, neural connections. It's very, very important to have uh, this uh, feature. So in recent years, uh, neuroscience has become a major pole of attraction for several disciplines. Um, and so uh, we have, um, uh, for instance, uh, a report, a report which was uh, published by the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation Development in June 2007, which was titled Understanding the Brain, the Birth of uh, Learning Science. It has greatly contributed to the development of neuroeducation. And the field of uh, 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 neuro, uh, uh, field of research, which is called educational neuroscience, covers multiple disciplines, including neuroscience, cognitive sciences, and education. 
It's a new research approach that attempts to bring together knowledge in neuroscience and education, especially through brain imaging techniques. And it aims to highlight certain educational problems in order to allow the possibility to propose new solutions. So in what, in, uh, how it uh, can help us, and your education makes possible to better understand all the nature work, uh, the nature of the cognitive work uh, carried out by the learner during the performance of certain tasks, to discover the effects of, of different types of education on the brain, measure the effectiveness of educational intervention, and to more quickly identify students with learning difficulties. That's why your education is very helpful in the field of special education, because it has helped us a lot uh, thanks to uh, the new sophisticated uh, brain imaging uh, devices. Um, so now uh, we can see what are the principles of brain compatible learning. First of all, it's brain, it's unique. We are all different and unique. We all have the same set of systems, but these systems are integrated differently within its brain and this makes us all different. And this diversity is actually the result of our genetic heritage, uh, different experiences, environments, and it must be understood that learners are different, that they uh, need choices, and they should be exposed to a wide variety of inputs. Second, learning changes the human brain. While we learn, uh, two types of changes uh, occur in the brain. A change in the internal structure of neurons, and an increase in the number of synapses, that means we have more dendrites, between neurons. By changing the stimulus, for example, the stimulus could be behavioral practice or mental exercise, the brain changes respectively. So the brain is also modified by experience. Multiple complex and concrete experiences are important for the growth of dendrites and the healthy functioning of the brain. The human brain actually is programmed to learn. And uh, uh, this need to learn appears to be a physiological need of the brain. Thanks to innate, as I said before, devices and mechanisms, the child learns when it, it comes in contact with the physical, material, familial, uh, social, and cultural environment. We are genetically programmed to explore, discover, reflect, and learn. Learning is developmental. Uh, we talked about uh, how this brain, uh, human brain is a miracle because it's an organ with an extraordinary adaptability and plasticity. Neurons are not fixed and are not uh, immutable entities. The brain constantly restructures and maintains its plasticity throughout its life. The adult brain, uh, play, uh, brain is pliable. And another uh, feature is that the brain is a multifunctional parallel processor. It, uh, this means that the brain um, processes all information simultaneously and continuously. Thoughts, emotions, imagination, and predisposition work simultaneously and interact with other processes of the brain. The brain is multifunctional since it performs multiple functions on multi multiple levels and in different ways. It consists of a system uh, of uh, adaptation, complicated activities, and the brain also, in addition, reduces information to parts and at the same time perceives it globally. We're talking about amazing mechanism. Um, the brain needs choices. The dynamics of the brain presuppose its capacity for free choice and decision making. So a human brain is not preformed, but structured in order to learn what it needs to learn when it is presented with the possibility of choice. So the teachers, for instance, should allow everyone to update the choice potential. And very important that our brain searches for order and organization. The brain seeks to bring order to chaos. Organization, including selection, ranking, and comparison is a biological necessity of our brain. Uh, so the uh, human brain also, uh, another important characteristic is that it works both linearly and uh, by association. Uh, that means that our brain organizes our thinking, it does not organize our thinking in a linear fashion, but globally and uh, by associations. That by associations means that it compares, it uh, integrates and relates and seeks uh, to give meaning to what it perceives. Association plays a very important role in almost all mental functions. Each word and idea has many links to other words, ideas, and concepts. The more associations you create in your brain, the more likely is that the information will be encoded in what we call long-term memory, 
and this way will be available for recall. Learning also presupposes connections with existing knowledge, then tries to resemble um, the branches of a tree and they develop from a branch that already exists. Therefore, when we learn a new concept or skill, the learner must establish a connection with prior knowledge of experience. We will going to see that this connection greatly. The brain searches for novelty. When we learn a new information, either new neural connections are made or the old connections are strengthened. So the brain learns when it enriches, when it adapts, and when it assimilates the predictable and the new. And we all know about the practice. Uh, we learn what, what we practice. We learn because when we practice, what happens? New uh, fibers, new dendrites grow and connect with each other. So we have a uh, neural synapses. Practice means making and correcting mistakes, learning from our own mistakes and trying constantly. Mistakes are a natural and necessary part of, of the learning process. Dendrites develop for what is being practiced. So in order to learn each new concept or skill, a learner brains build a new specific neural network for the learning object in question. And uh, attention plays a big role in learning because we all know that uh, our brain, human brain, stays alert only for about 10 minutes, I think, that uh, for um, young people, young children of today. Uh, I think that the, the time is less here. Uh, um, our young children today are suffering from um, distraction. Uh, so it's very difficult to maintain their attention. So in general, the dropout in a class or in under enterprise occurs before the quarter of an hour of an activity. So the challenge is to find a way to maintain and develop people's attention during a given time. The teacher can capture the attention of the learners through a multitude, uh, multitude of visual, of, of auditory, of kinesthetic uh, inputs, in new and emotional experiences and alienations. Um, we have also uh, that uh, we should see that learning always involves conscious and unconscious processes. The brain absorbs information of which it's directly aware with concentrated attention, but it also absorbs information which is beyond the immediate objective of attention. In fact, the brain reacts to the entire sensory context while we teach a communication occurs. And very important that the brain seeks pleasure the pleasure uh, center of our brain, or what we call reward circuit, tends to design the repetition of the stimulus or experience that causes pleasure. Every pleasant piece of information can cause what we call the release of dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that causes feelings of euphoria in the brain with the production of endorphins and activates the limbic system that we said before, which is the center of emotions. And learning becomes this way more enjoyable and is positively reinforced with inner motivation, interest, and active uh, participation here prevails. And our brain also learns best through multisensory process. So before, uh, we need to evolve all the senses and multiple treatments, multisensory stimuli promote the development. Why? Because this promotes development of the entire cortex, not uh, just one region. And repetition, repetition builds the brain. Why? Because current neurology has shown that the creation of uh, synaptic connections depends uh, in part of the repetition of stimuli. Repeated experiences create neural connections that lead to uh, learning. And uh, very, very important, our brain is social because according to neuroscience, our brain evolves and learns through interaction experiences with others. Learning is influenced in particular by the nature of our social relationships. Our brain seems to like learning from others. Natural development alone is not enough. And one of the distinguishing characteristics of the human species is actually this ability to learn from the experience of others. Um, very, very important search for meaning is innate relevance for information. We're going to explore that. Um, because um, the brain is engaged in finding multiple responses to a problem rather than finding the right answer. Um, this means that the brain is, um, is related to problem solving. Due to this process, which involves reasoning, it involves critical thinking and other high-level cognitive skills, neural growth can take place. So 
uh, a teacher, for instance, should create challenging and relevant learning experience, rich in problem-solving activities and situations where students can build their own understand content, they can organize it and think with the aid of their own cognitive models. It's uh, what happens with STEM education now, which is the future of education, uh, because uh, problem-solving is related closely with uh, STEM education, and uh, uh, there we try to give uh, authentic, real-life problems to, stu to students, because uh, um, knowledge should not be connected to reality, uh, because we should give authentic stimuli and um, uh, real world working conditions to our students. Uh, so um, the input should be meaningful, should be relevant, and it should be related to problem uh, solving. Um, and uh, another uh, issue is that learning process information takes time. We all know that we need time to learn because we need time to grow and connect the rights. The dendrites and synapses perhaps will start to disappear if they are not used or practiced. Uh, those that are not used or have never been widely used are eliminated for reasons of economy. So neuroscientists say the famous quote, if you don't use it, you will lose it. And learners have optimal learning, uh, very, very important. You know, uh, it's a, a tip that you should know that learners have optimal learning uh, times during the day in general. Uh, we need to receive, uh, we tend to receive the most information towards the start of the course. And then we experience a downtown time when retention decreases. Therefore, teachers have to organize varied lessons, make the lessons shorter and use many um, uh, other uh, teaching means and uh, uh, aids. And the brain needs structural breaks um, because... Um, uh, we feel the educational need to provide a structural breaks to create an alternation between taking formation and moments of interiorization of inner silence, evocation, activation. Why? Because the human brain cannot record an uh, infinite amount of explicit information. It needs breaks in order to internalize new information and replenish neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that transmit impulses from neuron to neuron. If the neurotransmitters are not renewed, the amygdala that I said before, which is uh, the, the limbic system and which is responsible for the fear, will block information and the memory efficiency will decrease. And if uh, of all those also the hippocampus, that I said before, it's, hippocampus is related to memory. Uh, if hippocampus is uh, overloaded, no, uh, no new learning can take place. And uh, the search for meaning, I said before, relevance is innate. The search for meaning is a goal. It is oriented towards survival. It is essential for our brain. Uh, the term uh, search in general for meaning means giving meaning to our experiences. New learning is more likely to be acquired and remembered if it is meaningful and relevant. New information is less likely to be rejected if it is straightforward and has relevance or value. So this learning should be effective and meaningful uh, to take account of experience and knowledge, uh, the personal history of our learners. And meaningful learning also involves the construction and reconstruction of meaning through our experience. And the search for patterns, what we call patternization, the concept of patternization refers actually to the organization or categorization of uh, meaningful information. The brain mind naturally organizes information into categories. And this process is called patternization. These patterns always involve uh, the, the interpretation of information in context. And this clearly illustrates the economics of the brain, the creation of mechanism. It is a system that groups similar events into categories and hierarchies. Education means increasing the patterns that students can use, can recognize and communicate. So patternization um, allows us to organize and connect new learning with what we already know it includes semantic maps, sema uh, diagrams, models, categories, both acquired and uh, innate. Our brain is therefore need designed to perceive and create patterns. This is why it resists all that is meaningless and any pattern that is imposed on him. If we give meaningless input to our students, for instance, this information will be deleted automatically from uh, uh, the um, from our brain, and it will never be stored into what we call long-term uh, memory. And uh, um, we have the learning pyramid. I don't know if I had here 
uh, here you can see the pyramid. Uh, this is founded of the results of research memorization carried out uh, by the National Training uh, Laboratories of Bethlehem, USA. And here we can see that according to this, this very, very famous uh, model, after two weeks, we tend to retain um, uh, what 10% of what we read, 20% uh, of what we hear, 50% of what we see, 7% of what we see and hear, 70% of what we say, and 90% of what we say and do. So this learning pyramid clearly illustrates that active participation in the learning process results in increased knowledge building and uh, retention. Um, learning, uh, as we say, we can see so far, we can understand that it's a holistic process. So we're talking about the great learning. It's understood as a process of holistic adaptation because it's a hemisphere of the brain processes information according to its specialty, a phenomenon which is uh, known as a lateralization of our brain, and then transmits its decision to the other hemisphere. In addition, its hemisphere is connected to the opposite part of the body. However, specialization um, in no way means separation. The two brains always collaborate. The two hemispheres always have complementary functions, always they cooperate and always interact. The left hemisphere is associated usually with language skills, arithmetic, logic, and the presentation of facts. In the right hemisphere intervenes mainly at the level of intuition, of emotion, appreciation of music, etc. But uh, you know that according to very, very recent, um, uh, re uh, recent data, Although we talk about the left and uh, right hemisphere, uh, this is not, uh, uh, this is not uh, so true because all these recent data show that actually uh, there are neural connections between the two of them and they, oh, they act together at the same time. Uh, so um, we need to, to adopt this holistic approach and not only say about talk about the left or right hemisphere because uh, the reality is that they act together at the same time and there are neural connections between them. Um, so, uh, human learning is deepened and enriched by the degradation of multiple ways of learning of our experiences, and we must opt for a holistic approach and integrated learning and integration of all uh, treatment modes, regardless of personal thinking style. We talked about uh, emotion and learning. The role of learning in uh, emotion learning is very important. Everything we learn is uh, organized uh, and organized by emotions and states of mind. Feelings and thoughts um, are shape each other and they cannot be separated. New scientific research suggests that new information that arouses pleasure is more easily to restore in the long term memory. And the flow of information is inhibited by fear and weakness, while positive emotions can affect and reinforce certain types of learning. And our brain responds to positive suggestions. Students experience both positive and negative emotions when they discover new knowledge for the first time. Teachers should promote then positive experiences and emotions for the students because negative emotions can lead to uh, the feeling of demotion or regression that reduces students' ability to learn on an optimal level. And a positive learning environment is important because teachers should start teaching enthusiastically, make sure everyone in the class feels comfortable and that everyone understands. Such teaching suggests also that we care about the learning of each learner separately and each positive suggestion sends a message to the learner's brain. Environment and learning, when the brain learns, it reacts to environment and it changes. So learning a new element allows uh, to allows people to transform their neural uh, networks in order to assimilate it. And through this uh, uh, process, the brain creates new neural connections throughout life. The creation of an environment uh, enriched by new learning experiences and challenges, as well as a stable sensory environment is essential for brain growth. Uh, so, now, what are all the educational implications of uh, these uh, uh, brain-based strategies? The principles strategies of uh, learning compatible with what we call the functioning of the brain could help students, first of all, to orientate themselves toward higher cognitive functions. When students are provided with learning opportunities, especially through meaningful and authentic activities with formative assessments and corrective feedback, the information could be consolidated in long-term memory. 
If uh, a teacher's take into account the function of brain, they can discover the state of students, living environment, abilities, interests, uh, learning methods. They can better identify uh, their needs. Uh, they can uh, better define uh, precise learning objectives for each one dynamically adapted teaching there. So teacher who uh, knows who know the principles of brain functioning seek to maintain the attention of students through sensory motor uh, experiences and awaken the senses and emotions throughout the entire unity unit of study. And the teacher provides also uh, multisensory representations, what we call uh, the use of multiple learning styles that promote brain growth and connections and support intellectual curiosity uh, and the development of research spirit, encouraging the student to suggest topics and projects uh, likely to seem interesting for them as a part of the lesson. Um, and uh, uh, at the start of teaching, teachers uh, usually need to, to embrace the power of novelty to, to destabilize the student and associate the new ideas with what students already know, making connections between current knowledge and new material and checking previously acquired cognitive material. So they should present relevant, uh, meaningful content and information since our brain is wired, as I said before, to pay attention uh, to things that are relevant to them, to each person and their, to its survival. Uh, so teachers should give uh, the possibility to, uh, of choice and promote the development of a wide range of mental, physical, aesthetic, social and emotional interests, skills and competencies. Uh, he should use a wide variety of methods and supports. He should use thought organizers, concept maps, incorporate role playing games, uh, mando mimes, rhymes into teaching. Um, because uh, and, uh, knowing the importance of very important to know the importance of repetition and respecting the laws of memorization, uh, he can uh, regularly review and repeat new knowledge uh, using elaborate repetition by making structuring breaks and mode uh, breaks to five to uh, from five to ten minutes. So the teacher involves all students in the learning process, promote active learning gives rise to various learning experiences, respects the individuality of each student and opts for differentiation to respond to diversity and promote equity. Fostering equity, of course, means allowing everyone to succeed. Um, so we need to integrate uh, learning into a network of social interactions, make interpersonal exchange a catalyst for learning, use uh, peer collaboration, collaborative learning and share knowledge. Furthermore, uh, the teacher tries to um, inspire intrinsic motivation and offer uh, frequent opportunities for creativity development. Uh, they seek to provide opportunities to reason, to deal with the subject in depth uh, in several aspects and to express uh, what we call uh, divergent thinking. They provide uh, enriched environments in order to develop critical and creative spirit. They, provide, uh, they promote uh, higher order thinking and the deep learning cultivate high level intellectual skills. They favor uh, complex activities instead of difficult activities. Another thing complex, another thing difficult. They prioritize questions instead of answers. We talked about problem solving, how it's important for the brain. Always current, real, personal questions provide specific immediate feedback. The role of feedback for the brain is very, very important. Breaks boredom with novelty and pleasure and creates a space to see, to hear, speak and reflect. So uh, a, a teachers take on account that student learning must meet them and need and include important aspects. The transfer of theoretical concepts to a professional reality in accordance with the function of the brain, adults especially learn when they feel the need and must be able to clearly perceive the usefulness of the proposed work. So students must be able to see the usefulness of what they're doing. They learn to learn uh, by experience independently and uh, collaboratively. And the teachers should also involve uh, students in real life learning, connect complex real world projects to students' personal interests, use inquiry and problem solving learning. And they try to create a pleasant atmosphere that promotes exploration, pleasure of learning, eliminating a sense of uh, threat. Minute, uh, a sense of threat, and uh, um, tries to create an atmosphere uh, marked by high degree of pleasure. They should take also 
uh, into consideration the importance of emotion we said before, positive and negative in learning, create a secure, safe climate. Climate, our brains need seek security, uh, uh, a healthy physical environment, engage emotion of students, and as I said before, and develop um, uh, emotional intelligence, skills, self-confidence, and uh, autonomy. Um, so, in this way, um, we can say that uh, uh, in this motivation is reinforced if uh, we give uh, frequent opportunities for creative, uh, creative development. Um, we need to seek uh, opportunities, provide opportunities to reason said before, provide rich environments, promote higher order thinking. And something else that uh, actually uh, it's, uh, it's well no not well known that the principles of uh, our devices, that of softwares and um, hardware that we use, they are compatible with the function of the brain. Uh, there are some uh, um, principles that uh, are uh, interrelated with uh, the function of brain, but we don't know about this. When we talk about the hyperdocument or nonlinearity in um, uh, computer science, a hyperdocument is a large connection of hypertext and hypermedia. And hypermedia is a set of information belonging to several types of media. We know that. And hypertext is a nonlinear text presented as a network of cross references within the same document or between separate documents. So hypertext must allow learner to connect ideas in a richer way that better conforms to associating function of the human mind. So the principle of nonlinearity, the basic principle of multimedia, resembles the structure of the brain, its networks, its uh, and the sections, as well as the learning process. Since the learner is constantly confronted with periods during an explosion of knowledge that takes place, place in the composition phases. So the first one is this, and the second one is what, what we said before about multimodality. Um, we all know that uh, all this um, the multimodality uh, refers to interaction between uh, images, animated or not sounds and texts. And this uh, actually um, uh, is related to uh, the principle of the brain because association of different languages facilitates the understanding of a message by the brain. Uh, because we said before that no part of the brain works in isolation, but all of them participate in the accomplishment of a common goal. So the combined solicitation by, of the brain by oral and visual stimuli activates the two hemispheres in parallel and make it possible to vary the angles of approach on the social information to present the same information. And uh, referentiality um, is the connection of the universe with uh, reference and, and thematic networks. Um, flexibility, versatility, adaptability also uh, it is uh, very uh, related also to human mind, uh, autonomy, variety, respectful learning styles, uh, we may have uh, learners with uh, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic style, so we need to respect that. Uh, and the use of multimedia usually should make it possible to respect the profiles on learning styles of the learners. Active participation of the learner, uh, the current, for instance, game games uh, for students, uh, for children, uh, try to, uh, to engage them more actively uh, and more dynamically. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, motivation. Uh, we all know also how uh, web uh, um, uh, changes, uh, shapes our uh, our brains, and uh, uh, also we talk because because heavy use of the brain uh, changes our brains. More experienced internet users activate more areas uh, in our brain, and studies show that increasing exposure to images via television, computer screens would increase our ability to orient ourselves in space. And uh, in addition, children who have grown up with a computer think very differently from adults. So this reasoning seems to work the same way uh, as uh, uh, hypertext links, because they jump from idea to idea, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, um, ICT multitasking is another uh, option, um, another thing that um, Characteristic by uh, all these devices, the feedback we said before, it changes, etc. Uh, and one theory that is related to cognitive neuroscience, actually, it was uh, one of the first one, Harold Gardner. We all know about this theory, which is very, very controversial nowadays. 
uh, Howard Gardner uh, tries to identify nine intelligence in uh, each region of our brain. And he talks about linguistic, logical, visual, physical, uh, musical, interpersonal, and interpersonal, naturalist, existential uh, intelligence. Um, and of course, he um, he uh, believes that its brain is, is different, unique. He tried to respect different learning profiles. According to him, as I said before, there are two hemispheres of the brain. We talked about how the left hemisphere is responsible for analytic uh, skills and reasoning uh, and um, um, uh, uh, critical, uh, critical uh, skills. And the other part, the other hand, we have the right hemisphere, which is usually related to intuition, to creativity, etc. But we uh, said that uh, the recent uh, data uh, of research show that uh, this hemisphere actually uh, collaborate each other. We cannot talk about, we cannot isolate actually the two hemispheres of the brain. They act at the same time. So, um, what are now the neuropedagogical basis of the learning process? How uh, an ideal lesson plan should be? So, we said that um, learning is a process that takes place in the brain. Learning is a metamorphosis of existing cognitive structures or the creation of new cognitive structures. And th today, uh, thanks to all these uh, basic uh, brain imaging devices, it's possible to study the brain uh, caused by student learning. So the first phase should be preparation. Before starting to teach a learning object, the teacher needs to capture the attention of students. And the best way to learn, as I said before, is novelty or humor or surprise. Because the brain is always uh, looking for something new. It is also uh, constantly looking for stimuli. And we all have uh, known about um, a region of the brain, the lower brain, known as the reticular activation system, which actually filters out stimuli, decides what to pay attention to and what to ignore. And there are neural, uh, in our brain, there are neurons of uh, novelty specialized in new impressions. They cause a state of vigilance, they attract attention. And uh, therefore, the teacher, the need for teachers to bury the stimulus and not always use uh, the same images, the same sounds, very important. So introduction, uh, here is a particular activation system which filters all the information. Uh, and uh, also, um, um, we can say that introduction is very, very uh, important uh, because uh, uh, the first time students are exposed to a given flow of information plays an important role in their ability to receive inform retrieve information efficiently later. So staying focused depends, of course, on relevance and meaning, as I said before. That's why we need to be careful to give uh, relevant uh, stimuli because our brain continually tries to understand the world and define if information it receives is relevant. Uh, um, <clears throat> it is also necessary to... Uh, relate uh, to relate um, past experience to uh, in order to connect them with new information to prior existing information or create experience with them. So the learning process begins with the process of incorporating new sensory perceptions into those already stored in the student's brain. Um, and um, we have uh, after this uh, the second phase, which is called acquisition. Here, um, uh, during uh, classroom lessons, the inputs, the inputs could be words, text, or images in the student's brain are picked up by their uh, by senses of uh, children or generated internally to them. So the teacher needs to take care to guide and support students in the process of appealing to his senses. And this is how he will strike, uh, as we say, uh, the senses of the student by suggesting concrete examples, various examples, by reminding them of experience and memories as to stimulate several uh, senses. Uh, so here we can see that the sensory functions allow each individual to collect information for the external environment, their organism, and allow them to adapt to all environmental situations. Um, how we can see how the limbic system here intervenes throughout the entire learning process. It stimulates the children to desire, to refuse, or tolerate. And uh, um, then for, uh, at the same time, the um, we can see how the cortex in our brain sends signals to the thalamus, which in turn filters those signals, distinguishes important features, amplifies important signals, and calculates the differences between the expected or observed signals. So at the same time, the inputs are routed to other specific regions for processing, and this routing is done instantly. 
The visual inputs are rooted to the occipital lobe, the linguistic inputs to the temporal lobe, and so on. So uh, or, uh, apart from this, we have information which is rooted to the subcortical regions, such as amygdala. And if there is a threatening information, the, for, for instance, we have information of the COVID, uh, in this way, the amygdala is activated and will alert uh, the rest of the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system to allow a quick response. So the brain receives information directly uh, or indirectly, and uh, we can see that how limbic system intervenes uh, throughout the entire language process. Um, and uh, the third part would be elaboration, uh, correction of uh, errors. The acquisition of new knowledge requires a significant, uh, of course, uh, investment in times of effort or perseverance on the part of the most, uh, or even the most competent uh, students. And um, um, in this uh, way, uh, we need to, to, uh, uh, to know that the brain explores uh, uh, every subject by a variety of explicit and implicit methods, reading, uh, for instance, explicit reading, listening, discussion, homework, etc. Uh, and our brain uh, uh, needs actually, it's a paradox to say, needs the error because the error itself is considered a bad connection. But learning from mistakes, offers opportunity to weaken um, uh, uh, to weaken bad connections in favor of more appropriate connections. So conceptions and prejudices are the fruit of erroneous connections which have not been er erased. Uh, and at the same time, we know how information processing and learning are time consuming, so progress must be made at a slow pace with breaks and pauses, a variety of activities. We said that the hippocampus cannot absorb a lot of information. So we are now, um, uh, ah, and I forgot to say that during the downtime, downtime, oh, we've said that allows the brain to process new information. The teachers can offer review activities such as games or lab activities, which allow students to practice and uh, what we have learned. So um, many new inputs uh, are uh, kept in what we call frontal lobe or for short-term memory. Short-term memory uh, stores information for uh, five to 20 seconds. Most of these inputs are filtered and then discarded without being remembered if we said before they are not relevant. On the contrary, if they are relevant, they will be rooted to the hippocampus and will be maintained there. If the new learning material is considered important, it is organized and indexed by the hippocampus and they're stored in the cortex. Um, so the more uh, associations, so remember we uh, have uh, uh, the hippocampus organizes short, as I said before, processing the incoming information before sending them to different areas of the cortex for long-term memorization. And the more associations are created in the brain, the more likely is it that information will be encoded in long-term memory and will be available for retrieval. Uh, and when information is stored in long-term memory, what happens? We have new synaptic contacts that appear. Uh, contacts that appear. Uh, new synapses. So the long-term effect of learning is the stabilization of memory by the growth of new synaptic contacts in the brain. Um, this is what we said before. And um, I remember some tips that uh, learners best memorize information which is presented at the start. The information memorized second is that uh, which is presented at the end of the lesson. And learners rarely memorize information presented in the middle. So we must be careful, uh, especially in the introduction, how to introduce uh, stimuli that will uh, be uh, novel, that will be original, that will strike the senses of uh, our students. Um, and uh, uh, here we can see how um, uh, the neural pathway initially used to process new information can become a permanent route if the brain reuses the stored information. So what we called before about practice and repetition, because repetition reinforces memory. Information uh, requires repetition uh, by students if they won't be able uh, to recover it. We, we all know this by our experiences, uh, in a way. And there are several ways to improve memory, such as mental development, quality, quantity uh, associations, creating the brain, prior learning, motivation, repetition, revision, emotional intensity, memorization facilitated by the use of um, of uh, what we call mind maps or heuristic diagrams, uh, which facilitate recall uh, via the brick system connections. All these visual clues are very, very important because they organize knowledge in patterns. 
We said before how our brain is organized in patterns. So when we introduce a new uh, scientific concept, for instance, it's uh, important to use visual clues and uh, mind maps or heuristic diagrams. And what I said before, when we introduce a new concept, uh, it should be not only original, but at the same time should uh, have connections with prior knowledge. So we have we need to facilitate recall uh, via the pre-existing connections between new and old information. And we need to reactivate information in order to send it to be inscribed in long-term uh, memory. And uh, um, we should say also that uh, learning involves much more than just communication between neurons. It requires neurons to activate together to create relationships so that information can be recalled and applied. Building relationships with that a student already knows and engaging emotions can help promote long-term uh, learning. And frequent reviews, as I said before, helps to ensure retention and recall because repetition as a biological effect involves uh, these stages, solidity of connections, what we call myelination, acceleration of inflammation flows, solidity of synaptic buttons, integration of processes in procedural memory. Um, <clears throat> and uh, remember also that new connections between neural networks can be established or strengthened, but they can also weaken and disappear. And the disappearance of connections is uh, uh, called synaptic pruning. And uh, is what uh, we said before, if you don't use it, you will lose it. That our brain deteriorates only when it is not being used. This is why now we have seen that uh, there are many, many brain games that are used in order to help all people to um, um, enhance their memory and uh, uh, facilitate their learning uh, uh, even at this age. And uh, um, new school activities, all our activities should be oriented towards the upper regions of the brain, what we call higher order thinking, which increases understanding and retention. Um, and uh, all these higher order thinking um, uh, uh, skills are related to the frontal lobe of the brain. And of course, this helps students to make connections, as I said before, between new and old learning to create new pathways, to strengthen existing pathways, to increase possibility of consolidation and storage for future recovery. And the four pillars, remember, uh, for the functional integration or extended use are attention that serves to select information, massively modulated activity, active engagement, feedback, immediate and unity action progress and close time to the error, and the automation of knowledge and procedures, a transfer from the explicit to the implicit which involves repetition and uh, training. I forgot to say that all what we said before are related very closely to 21st century skills. We talk about critical thinking, creativity, problem solving. What we said before about the principles of the brain are related to the 21st century skills. So if we know very well how to apply brain-based strategies, then we will be able, as educators, to help better our students promote 21st century skills. Um, uh, in April 2020, when the uh, COVID pandemic um, started, I wrote um, an article which had uh, a, great, a great impact all around the world. It had one million readers. It's uh, actually, you can find it in the internet and in the, the national magazine uh, K-12 Digest and also in another uh, journal, uh, university journal uh, here in Greece, which uh, it was also presented in the Greek national television, uh, this um, my paper. And this actually guide to educators about how to cope with the COVID pandemic. And there I propose using principles of neuroeducation. And there I propose, I suggest all what I said before, how it's important to create positive emotion during the COVID pandemic, uh, to give strong emotional uh, stimuli because this way uh, uh, knowledge can be absorbed and be learned better. Uh, how it's important to help our students express themselves and their feelings uh, about the COVID pandemic. Uh, because this is cathartic and liberating. How to put to make learning pleasant, uh, because I said before, learning is uh, reinforced by challenge, inhibited by threat. Uh, so we need challenging activities, uh, especially during remote learning. Remote learning is, by definition, something boring, something uninteresting. So it's up to us to find and maintain the um, attention of our students during remote learning through challenging activities that could improve, improve memorization and uh, um, increase attention. 
develop social skills. We talk about social distancing, but it's only uh, physical. It shouldn't lead to isolation. We have many collaborative platforms. We have forums, we have chats, we have wikis. Uh, all that blocks that we can leverage uh, uh, and other collaborative uh, tools that we can leverage in order to promote our students' uh, social skills, such as uh, solidarity, trust, empathy, etc. Um, create a safe environment. We need to tell them that everything is going to be okay. We know how children nowadays suffering from serious mental health disorders such as anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and um, uh, suicide and many other mental health disorders. So our challenge now as educators is not uh, actually how to use learning platform, uh, plan management platform. I believe that more or less uh, the majority of teachers are uh, familiarized with uh, technology. This is not our challenge. The challenge is that now we have to help our students um, psychologically, morally. Uh, we have assumed multiple roles. We are guides, we are facilitators, we have mentors, we are not only input providers. And adopt the appropriate methodologies. What is appropriate methodology is what fits best to our students, to the rhythm, to the needs, the interests, etc. Uh, so, uh, apart from this, before concluding, uh, I want to say that all that uh, are related uh, to um, what we call emotional intelligence and the components of emotional intelligence and social skills, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, and empathy. And here we talk about cell. Cell is social emotional learning, uh, which is important for uh, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making. And why it is important because it provides positive foundation upon which students can learn about themselves and others in a safe, nurturing school environment. It offers approaches to education that values autonomy, gives, gives opportunity to create positive habits, improves their mental and physical health, familial relationships. Uh, they help them reduce problem behaviors, uh, help students identify their own self -contact, uh, concept, uh, teach empathy. Teach them to manage their feelings and resources, uh, help them practice self-improvement strategies. And according to research, the outcomes of cell implementation are that it can reduce bullying, uh, alcohol use, absenteeism, math scores, literacy, family bonding, and overall positive, uh, increase uh, overall uh, positive development in early childhood. Ways to integrate social and emotional learning throughout the day. Uh, help us, uh, students to work on partnerships, to learn how to uh, work in teams, natural culture of kindness, practice role of role playing. I use storytelling. Um, storytelling is very, very important to uh, help them uh, share their experiences, especially during the COVID pandemic. Uh, role playing is also very important, especially in primary education. Uh, build, uh, help them build social and emotional vocabulary, make space for reflecting, writing, allow time uh, for talk. Um, and uh, uh, help them how to manage conflicts, um, to um, hold regular class meet, uh, meetings, uh, foster deep connections, encourage expression through art. It's not accidental that uh, through the co uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic, many artistic competitions were organized on the topic of the COVID pandemic. This is because uh, art is uh, uh, cathartic. And another part is, according to neuroeducation, I forgot to say that, why, are, uh, why art is proven scientifically, which is important. When we learn a new concept, as I said before, we create in our brain many uh, neuron, co uh, uh, new, uh, neuron connections, uh, what we call synapses. Um, when uh, uh, art is considered to help us to view uh, a subject, new subject in multiple ways, so uh, art can help us uh, create more neural synapses in our brain. So scientifically, art have been proven to be very important, beneficial to um, uh, development and neural growth. So thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, I hope it was uh, this information will be valuable for you, and I hope this can help you um, utilize all this information. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rania, it was so wonderful presentation. And I love the way you started and the content which I was looking at, it was so wonderful to see uh, that uh, you have covered each and everything in that, which I loved a lot because there were so many things uh, and we have received a lot of questions to ask from the prof regarding the emotional intelligence, the social pressure, the social uh, neuro uh, effect, how, how the social peers, they affect you and everything you covered in that one 
is so wonderful and i love your uh, knowledge retention rate uh, which you showed the pyramid knowledge pyramid it was so wonderful most of the time people always uh, talk about that how can we learn more or how to retain more knowledge so you have mentioned with the right giving the reference which is the usually researcher they give reference whatever they say because that is very much important uh, to give reference uh, so you have showed it and uh, i love your phrase that uh, uh, use your brain uh, use it or lose it so it was so wonderful uh, thank you very much i personally learned a lot from this session and so many theories and so many things you have mentioned and congratulations you have done a lot of work and that's why you have been featured on different magazines and this is why you are the leader of this the field and uh, really neuroscience and neuro education is a wonderful thing to study because it is so uh, amazing to see how our brain is uh, working as you mentioned in your slide it's the uh, multifunctional processor uh, so wonderful yes and uh, the way it is wired is what to give attention i love your four pillars of that uh, so wonderful so powerful content above everything your energy was so uh, great that uh, for a moment i was not uh, uh, I, I was so engaged in the uh, your presentation and highly deeply engaged that uh, i couldn't think of something else because uh, everything was coming and uh, i tried to catch the a basic essence of that because uh, it is so rich and uh, so many things and that's what i usually say that the, that's the beauty of the expert that they bring the whole ocean in a one drop uh, and make it squeeze in that way so you did the same thing uh, in such a one hour session you give uh, and you enlighten us on neuro education a lot and i i know that you have learned through a very struggle way you have uh, struggled a lot you have sacrificed a lot the time energy and money and you have learned it and uh, thank you very much for sharing with the people such a great knowledge and things uh, since you have covered most of the question but still there are some doubts of the people they want to ask so i will quickly ask the few question uh, because that would further enlighten them uh, to know it uh, the first question uh, they want to ask is uh, that please remove my misconception that should the leader only study the neuro education or is it for the executory people as well because there are short courses out there so uh, if you are not intending for the leadership position should you not study the neuro education uh, please uh, uh, clear my doubt yes. <laughs> no no i fully disagree with this <laughs> yeah i fully disagree with this uh, it's actually misconception because uh, I proved before that uh, how it's important for all educators, for instance, to know and apply all these strategies. Uh, because uh, if we don't this, uh, if we don't give, for instance, uh, an input, a meaningful input to our students, we're going to lose our students. If we don't pay attention to emotion, uh, we will have another problems. Uh, we said about how it's important to uh, act as uh, advisors and psychologues, especially during the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is nothing to do with leadership. It has to do with how to become a better teacher and how to learn um, uh, how our brain works and the inner workings of our brain. Because this will help us not only in teaching, as I said before, but only in business, in, uh, um, in um, other kinds of management, but not only to become a leader, just to be more uh, efficient in our uh, profession. And actually, it's uh, something that applies to our curiosity. I mean, it's very fascinating to learn about how these neural uh, connections uh, work in our brain. It's, it has nothing to do with leadership. Oh, very nicely said. Uh, thank you very much for removing the doubt of that person because sometimes the people get confused on it. And when the expert says and give the uh, um, expert opinion on that, then the people get it. And uh, because what you say is very much impact and impactful. Thank you very much. Uh, another question prof we have is a, it's a general question but uh, you are the right person to ask the question that is it possible to read human's mind in the future what's your take on that yes please all it's possible <laughs> with the exponential growth of technology and we have artificial intelligence also with new types of simulation etc i think that yes we will possibly i think that there are some experiments that are uh, uh, that are made in a secret agency of governments I think that we are very close to that, yes. And I have seen some uh, researches about uh, how artificial intelligence is applied to emotions. I mean, they can scan 
uh, photos of your photos and they can uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence shows immediately what are your emotions now we're talking if i scan your photo artificial intelligence will tell me what are your feelings this is actually happening it's happening in the business context i have oh, seen recent nice. research about so it's interesting this one to, to explore about this one yeah very nicely said prof and that remind me one thing that i was talking to one professor in the europe he was telling me that nowadays uh, uh, the hr department what they do is they conducting the interviews through a machine they will scan your muscles and they will uh, try to figure out that whether you whatever you are saying is the uh, the truth or the lie so so many things so it means that uh, that's why we have to be very uh, you know uh, efficient and uh, we have to be very good now at things because uh, there are machines who are going to uh, investigate it whether it is right or wrong so yes of course that is very much possible and in future uh, we may get control over it uh, okay prof we have another question that uh, what is your opinion they want to ask that the role of arts does art support the development of the brain academic operating system as well do you think so yes please yeah, i said before first of all is something that is scientifically proven because uh, we say that when we learn a new concept new uh, neural connections are created uh, given the fact that arts help us see um, a topic through multiple point of views this way, neuroeducators uh, tells us that uh, uh, art can create more neural synapses. This is scientifically proven. But apart from this, I'm an educator, primary education. I apply STEM. STEM is the art, or is uh, uh, STEM. We all know science, technology, engineering, mathematics. If we integrate art, also we have STEM. So I always adopt STEM in my uh, teaching and learning practice. It has amazing results in primary education. It's impossible, for instance, to teach science. In primary education, we found a great art. It's impossible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this could be artistic and aesthetic representations, painting, everything. Uh, so uh, yes, it's, it's something that is uh, scientific. It's very, very efficient. That I have seen from my own experience also. Yeah. Well, nicely said, Prof. Thank you very much for such elaborative answer. Uh, one last question. We know that you are super busy and you are going to attend another our important meeting as well. Uh, Prof, the question is very much uh, uh, important and uh, kind of personal as well that how do you manage the time while uh, doing so many activities simultaneously, the e-conferences, the conferences, the meeting, since you are in the education ministry as well, at the same time you are doing the teaching and all the research stuff as well. So please enlighten our audience that uh, how to uh, how do you manage your time and what do you recommend for them as well yes please the secret is that when you love what you're doing you're doing uh, the best this is uh, my my message I, I love what i'm doing <laughs> yes, i'm yes, fully yes. dedicated and fully committed to this so yes. i can't recognize tiredness or uh, any other uh, obstacle <laughs> oh, very nice message to the world uh, because uh, we, we ask our guests at the end that what's your message, but you have already given it because uh, what you do, you love it. So once you love it, you all enjoy the time and the work as well. Uh, we had a last uh, session with the Dr. Chris from Australia, and it was that uh, uh, it's not my work, it's my passion. So that's why I don't uh, get time. So it was the same thing. Uh, you are passionate researcher, teacher, so it's a wonderful thing. So once again, thank you very much for such a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, I, I would say that indeed it was enlightenment session with you because uh, in a, such a one hour session, we learned a lot. Thank you very much for your wonderful time and wonderful message to the world. Uh, in the last, I would say that indeed neuroeducation and its application is very beneficial. You have to learn it, practice it, and uh, the guidance which uh, the great expert has shared, uh, take advantage of it. Uh, do follow the distinguished guest speaker to her research work and you can email her for future learning and guidance. She is very generous and always ready to help the people. So moreover, a wonderful explanation, a powerful content which the great speaker has already elaborated will help you to learn, develop uh, your understanding regarding the neuroeducation. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much uh, once again, Prof. Rania Lempo for your wonderful presentation time. And I would like to thank our audience as well who joined us.
If you have any additional question uh, about the information shared today, you can email us or you can connect the, the speakers directly to her email address or social media. Uh, thank you all for your support and liking our session. Stay tuned as many sessions are on the way. So do not miss any session until next session.